When you're new to Seven Days to Die, setting up a new game can be overwhelming when confronted with all the settings that you can change. In this video I will go through all the important game settings and explain what each of them does and more importantly, the things to consider when setting up a new single player survival game within 7 days to die. Hello everyone, my name is Brody and welcome to the new player's guide to 7 days to die, where today we will be covering the game settings and setting up a new single player survival game. As always, 7 Days to Die is a game that is still in development and the information in this video may change in the future. If so, I will put the updated information or a link to the updated video in a pinned comment down below. Now that you're ready to begin your very own zombie apocalypse, let's review the game settings and see what the important ones do and how they affect the game. Click New Game and let's get started. In the New Game window, you can choose a name for your save file. Anything will do here, so go crazy. I suggest leaving the game world as Navas game, as this is the default world created by the developers and is a good starting world for learning the game and its mechanics. Maps, points of interest lists and other information about Navas game can be found online to help you along the way. But for now, let's look at the general tab over on the right. For my single player worlds, I always change the server visibility to not listed so that it is not visible to other people. Okay, that one is pretty straightforward. Moving on. <laughs> Before we discuss the difficulty settings in seven days to die, there are two major damage types to consider. Entity damage, which covers damage dealt to players, zombies and animals, and block damage, which covers the damage dealt to the items and environment of the game's world. In the difficulty settings, there are six options to choose from, ranging from the easiest setting, scavenger, up to the most difficult setting, insane. Each difficulty has a different set of damage multipliers that makes the game easier or more difficult, whichever one you choose. Although the default difficulty on screen is Adventurer, the standard game difficulty according to the game files is actually Nomad. As this difficulty setting does not have any damage multipliers to either the player's or the AI's entity damage. The AI in this circumstance is the zombies and the animals of the game's world. In comparison, the easiest setting scavenger increases the player's entity damage to 150% of its base statistics and decreases the AI's entity damage down to 50%. While the most difficult setting of insane reduces the player's entity damage down to 50% of its base statistics and increases the AI's entity damage up to a massive 250%. That means that on the insane difficulty, you'll practically tickle the zombies while they hit you like a dump truck. These damage multipliers are only applied to the base statistics of entity damage only, and not to the base statistics of block damage modifiers. These can be adjusted in the block damage and blood moon block damage multipliers within the new game options advanced tab later on. The default setting when you first load up the game will be adventurer and I suggest keeping it at this level until you've become more experienced and familiar with the game. The Adventurer difficulty level increases the player's entity damage to 125% and lowers the AI's entity damage down to 75%, making you slightly tougher to kill and the zombies and animals slightly easier to kill. Now, isn't that nice? You can change how long the 24 hour cycle lasts in increments of 10 minutes from 10 up to 60 minutes real time, which is the default setting. Higher 24 hour cycles are available and separated by 30 minute intervals at 60, 90 and 120 minutes real time. The 24 hour cycle is how long the day and night lasts combined. You can also define the time that the sun rises in game by adjusting the daylight length time to control how many in game hours there are in each daylight period, either 12, 14, 16 or 18 in-game hours in each in-game day. Sun will always set at 10pm or 2200 hours and rise at either 4am, 6am, 8am or 10am as defined by this setting. To recap, the shorter the day length here, the later the sunrise. The daylight length of 18 hours is the default setting and I suggest you leave this and the 24 hour cycle setting as they are for now. Now let's take a look at the basic tab across the top. Blood Moon Frequency sets how often you have the Blood Moon Horde event, more commonly known as Horde Night. The settings here range from Horde every one day right through to Horde every 30 days, and you can also disable the Horde Night altogether here. But where's the fun in that? I suggest you leave the Blood Moon Frequency at its default setting of 7 days. But if you'd like to give yourself more time to prepare, 
repair, build and rebuild in between each horde knight, feel free to extend this if you want to. Blood Moon range in a nutshell is a variable which can randomise the date in which horde nights occur, ranging from 0 all the way up to 20 days. As an example, if you have the Blood Moon frequency set to 7 days and the Blood Moon range set to 0, the horde night will only happen on days which are the multiples of 7. Day 7, day 14, day 21, 28, etc. But if you have the Blood Moon frequency set to 7 days and the Blood Moon range set to 3 days, the Horde Knight could happen on either Day 7, Day 8, Day 9 or Day 10 randomly. 7 days plus the 3 day variable equals Day 10. But thanks to the next setting called Blood Moon Warning, you will be notified of the impending Horde Knight when the day number at the top of your hood turns red. So the Horde Knight, although randomised with the Blood Moon range setting, will not be a total surprise. You can set this warning to either occur in the morning at 9am or in the evening at 6pm whichever you prefer. The Blood Moon Warning setting can also be disabled if you are a fan of surprised Horde Knights, but I'd keep this switched on and the Blood Moon setting set to their defaults until you are more familiar with the Horde Knight and its mechanics. Or not, if you want to get caught in the middle of nowhere during Horde Knight with your pants down. Zombies are the primary threat of Seven Days to Die and are currently found all over the game world, but not all zombies are created equal. The zombie speed setting can alter the movement speed of the four main zombie groups within the game. Each setting has five different movement speeds. From slowest to fastest they are walk, jog, run, sprint and nightmare. Zombie day speed controls the movement speed of zombies during the day. Zombie Night Speed controls the movement of zombies during the night. Zombie Feral Speed controls the movement speed of the more difficult feral zombies during the day and night. And Zombie Blood Moon Speed controls the movement speed of the zombies during the Horde Night. In my opinion, the default settings for the zombie movement speeds are challenging enough for new players. So I'd leave them as they are for now. But if you do want to make the game easier, slow the zombies down. And if you want to make things a little bit more challenging, feel free to speed them up. Zombie Feral Sense is a topic that could be covered in its own video, but for simplicity's sake, when activated, this will increase the distance in which zombies will be attracted to you by a movement, line of sight or noise within the game world. With this setting set to day, night or all, the zombies will hunt you down from greater distances during the chosen period, so be prepared to be continually swarmed by the undead if you have this switched on. I'd suggest leaving this off for now, but you do you. The XP multiplier is exactly that. You'll gain experience at an adjusted rate equal to the chosen multiplier. You can turn this up to 300% at its maximum and watch the XP roll in, or you can turn this down to 25% at its lowest if you're the type of person that loves the grind. Although jacking this up and earning 300% XP sounds like a good time, this will also increase the speed of your game progression. Known as your game stage, this number will rise much quicker and bring on tougher enemies in larger numbers much, much quicker. Game stage is a topic that is quite complex, so in the interest of time, let's just say that the higher the number is, the more difficult the enemies are you'll have to deal with. I will expand on this in a future video though, so make sure you stay tuned and subscribe for that. In the game settings advanced tab, the top three options are the block damage multipliers and are percentage modifiers designed to make destroying blocks either easier or more difficult. These settings range from 25% which makes destroying blocks more difficult up to 300% which makes destroying blocks much easier. Playing a block damage determines the damage dealt to blocks by a player. That's you. AI block damage determines the damage dealt to blocks by zombies and animals. They're the bad guys. AI Blood Moon block damage is the same as AI block damage in that it is the damage dealt by zombies and animals. Although this setting is their block damage dealt during the Horde Night mode. So for example, you could have zombies set to have a normal block damage of 100% AI block damage all the time, but then have them turn into undead wrecking balls during the Horde Night by setting the AI Blood Moon block damage to 300%. Please don't do this, you will regret it. 
I suggest leaving these at their defaults for now, or maybe increasing the player block damage to make the grind of collecting resources a little quicker when salvaging and harvesting. Or you can turn down the Blood Moon AI block damage to make the zombies and animals hit softer during the Horde Night and give your base blocks a bit more survivability. Loot Abundance is another multiplier, with this one either increasing or decreasing the amount of loot you find in the world, both in loot containers and in the zombie loot base. You can reduce the quantity of loot you find by lowering this setting down to 25%, or increase the quantity by raising it up to 200%. This does not affect the quality of the loot that you get in loot containers or in the zombie loot banks, as the quality is governed by several factors including container type, biome, loot stage, buffs and others. So in the interest of time, let's just say that the higher this number is, the higher the loot quality will be subject to the rarity and the probability of the looted item within the looted container. Confused yet? Don't worry, I will expand on this in a future video, so make sure you stay tuned and subscribe for that. But the thing to remember is looting with a higher loot stage in a more difficult biome from containers in bigger points of interest can potentially equal higher quality loot. Loot respawn time is pretty self-explanatory. When you loot a backpack, box, trash pile or other loot container, it takes however long you set this to in in-game days to restock. For example, with this setting set to 7 days, if you loot a backpack on day 1, it will remain empty until day 8, whereas if by magic, there will be no loot inside. I personally have this disabled, as I like to progress through the world with an air of realism to the game. I hate myself for saying this, but if this were the real zombie apocalypse, backpacks just wouldn't refill themselves magically. But that's just me. You do you. You can set the loot respawn time to be every 5, 7, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 or 50 days. In 7 Days to Die, a player has two main areas to store their tools, weapons and resources. Their inventory and their tool belt. Upon your death, the drop on death setting can determine what happens to your precious belongings after the zombies finish eating your insides. You can choose to drop everything on your death which means that when you respawn back into the world you are naked and you have nothing on you you can make your way back to where you died to collect your possessions by following the blue backpack icon on the compass hood and map upon collecting your backpack you will have successfully retrieved all of your possessions and can continue with what you were doing Drop Toolbell only works the same as Drop Everything, but upon respawning you will still have all of your inventory items, but your tool belt will be empty. These items will have to be collected in the same way by making your way to the blue backpack icon on the compass, hood or map if you would like to get them back. Backpack only works exactly the same way as Tool belt only, but in reverse. With backpack only, you retain your tool belt items but have to retrieve your inventory items by making your way to the blue backpack icon on the compass, hood and map if you would like to get them back. You can also live your life dangerously and choose to delete all of what you were carrying upon your death. Or you can choose to play it safe to start with by choosing drop nothing and respawning with everything that you had on you. Choosing the drop nothing option is a great way to start. I'd recommend this to begin with unless you're feeling brave enough to run naked and unarmed into a zombie infested building in order to get your stuff back. Drop on quit has the same options as drop on death but is for when you quit the game. I suggest leaving this on nothing to make life easier when you load back into the game. Blood Moon Count is a setting ranging from 4 enemies up to 64 enemies that is more complicated than it would appear to be at face value. Simplicity, this is a cap which limits the number of Blood Moon enemies that will spawn in each of the waves of the Blood Moon Horde Knight event or Horde Knight. Similar to Game Stage and Loot Stage, the Blood Moon Horde count and the Horde Knight mechanics are a topic that are quite complex. I will cover these in their own video soon, but until you are comfortable with dealing with Horde Knight, I would suggest leaving this on its default of 8 and then maybe increase it as your confidence or base building skills does. Enemy respawning turned on or off simply adds or removes the ability for zombies and animals to respawn in the world. That's it. That's, 
that's pretty much it for that. So, moving on. During your adventures in the Seven Days to Die world, an airplane will periodically drop supply crates from the sky with a parachute. Once the crate has landed, you can loot it and usually pick up some decent items and resources. I say usually because sometimes it is actually pretty poor quality stuff, but it is still worth checking them out when they drop. The airdrop setting determines how frequently the drops will happen, either every day, every three days or every seven days. This can also be disabled if you'd like to go it alone and turn air supply drops off altogether. And to make things easier on yourself and save yourself hours of roaming the zombie and animal infested countryside, turn on marked airdrops so that as you're getting to grips with the game, the map and the compass system can help you find them. Look out for plumes of smoke when you're close to these crates, open them up and fill your boots. Well, your backpack, not your boots. A lot of the multiplayer settings are tailored towards multiplayer, obviously, but two of them are worthy of mention in reference to single player games also. Claim size refers to the size in blocks of one of the sides of a square that is the area of protection around your land claim block. Let me explain. In single player, a block called a land claim block can be placed down and creates a 41 by 41 block square by default with the land claim block as its center. This 41 by 41 square creates a dead zone that reaches from bedrock, the world's lower limit, to the sky block, the world's upper limit, where zombies and animals cannot spawn. Essentially, this is a safe zone that can be used to prevent bad guys spawning in your base and or your house. Bedroll acts as a respawn point that you can set down in the world. And this also provides a 15 by 15 square dead zone with the bedroll as its center. The bedroll dead zone also functions the same as the land claim block dead zone and prevents zombies and animals from spawning also. A lot of people that play Seven Days to Die have two bases, one to live at and one to fight the horde at. To achieve a dead zone at each, some players place a land claim block at the horde base and a bedroll at the home base, or vice versa. I'd suggest placing the land claim block where you eventually place your workstations and electrical traps. If you decide to use these, this will allow you to pick them up and move them if needed. The choice of whether this is at your home or your horde base is yours though. Also, if you die on horde night, having your respawn point, your bedroll, away from your horde base has its advantages when respawning back into the world. The last thing you want to do is respawn back into that board of the dead. And I believe that covers it for the game settings within the new player's guide to 7 days to die. By now you should be able to confidently set up a new game with any options that you desire and understand what the important settings are and what to change to really tailor the game to your liking. If I have missed anything or you would like to ask me any questions about anything in this video, please feel free to do so in the comment section below. I hope that you've enjoyed this video and I hope that you've learned something that will help you in your zombie apocalypse survival within 7 days to die. If you have, please leave a like on this video and consider subscribing to the channel for more 7 days to die content. And if you would like to join our community head over to our discord, the link for that and for the other ways of supporting the channel are in the description down below. I'd like to thank you for joining me today and I hope you have a great day. I hope to see all you next time but until then, take care and bye for now.